Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Sarah Fenske. St. Louis has a brand new aquarium. It opened on Christmas Day, and it's drawn absolutely huge crowds to Union Station ever since. Last week, our producer Evie Hemphill was among them. The last train departed St. Louis's Union Station many years ago. Or did it? Step inside the new St. Louis Aquarium now housed there, and the first thing you'll experience is a virtual train ride through Gateway City history, conducted by someone who sounds an awful lot like St. Louis-born actor John Goodman. Hello folks, I'm John Tickerman, your conductor and tour guide today. We start our journey on September 1st, 1894, when the first train departed Union Station. St. Louis was introduced to the world in 1904, when it hosted both the Olympics and the World's Fair. Look, the stadium and fair exhibits are right outside our windows. St. Louis was booming in the 1920s. By 1940, we reached over 800,000 residents. The 60s brought us the Gateway Arch. And today, hold on to your seat. Here we go. aquarium is just two weeks old, but it's already as packed with visitors as it is with wide-ranging marine species. And when aquarium goers step foot inside, it's some of our own region's creatures they meet first. The opening observation area features paddlefish, sturgeon, alligator gar, catfish, and other native species living in our rivers. It's a cherished aspect of the new attraction because it showcases fellow St. Louis area inhabitants most of us never see. Aquarium representative Nancy Milton guides the way through, and then we round a corner and come to one of her favorite places, the piranha exhibit. So I had no idea piranha were this beautiful. Oh, wow, and yeah. They, aren't they serene? They don't, you know, their reputation is very fierce, but the aquarium staff will tell you that that's not really the way things are with them. They're just a beautiful, beautiful, coppery, sparkly fish. Throughout the aquarium, more traditional exhibits are interspersed with interactive highlights. There's a long line of visitors waiting to get up close and personal with a species known as the doctor fish. One by one, kids and adults alike gather their courage and stick their hand in a shallow tank where a multitude of tiny fish race towards their fingers for a nibble. Hope Smiley is among them. It felt like little bubbles like on my hand and you could almost like feel them like nibbling at it. I did not keep it in there very long. It was, uh, it was crazy. I don't know. My sister liked it though. So. The aquarium's young river otters, Sawyer, Finn, and Thatcher, have been a popular draw as well as they zip around their new habitat and interact with visitors. So have the sharks, which share an enormous 250,000 gallon tank with stingrays and much more. Midway through Shark Canyon, Edwardsville residents Justin and Stephanie Milam offered their impressions of the new aquarium as a whole. I think it's awesome. Um, I think everything that they're adding is really cool, and I can't wait to see what else they can bring in. (laughs) This has been a really fun experience. I think it adds a lot to the city of St. Louis, and it kind of adds another reason for people to come and see how great our city is. Nick Naughton and his younger brother Vinny also shared some thoughts on the attraction. There was a lot of different animals. Um, When we were touching the stingrays, it was really weird because I've never touched one of those before, so slimy. <laughs> did you get to touch the stingrays too? You didn't want to? Well, what, what did you enjoy the most? Um, the sharks, because they're big, and I, and I like the holes that I, got, that I got to go in to see like all the, all the, whatever they're called, the otters. That was fun. Do you guys think you'll be back? Yes. 
And that trip inside the aquarium was brought to you by one of our producers, Evie Hemphill, who stopped by Friday. It was sold out that day, and as of last week, nearly 80,000 visitors had made it inside. So joining us now to talk about this wildly popular attraction is Tammy Brown. She's the executive director of the St. Louis Aquarium. Tammy, welcome to the show. Thank you. And we're also joined today by Aaron Sprawl. He's the curator of the St. Louis Aquarium. Aaron, welcome to the show. Thank you. And for those of you listening, we want to invite you to join our conversation. What were your first impressions of the St. Louis Aquarium? Or do you have a question for our guests? You can give us a call at 314-382-8255. That's 382-TALK. Or you can send us a tweet at STL on air or email us at talk at stlpublicradio.org. Tammy, you're estimating that it will be 100,000 visitors by the end of this week. Was that higher than projections? It was definitely higher than our expectation. We knew that we would be welcoming lots of crowds to the aquarium since it opened right during the holiday season when kids are off school and everything. But yeah, I don't think um, we realized it would be quite like that. So on one hand, that's a really good thing. It's great to see all this pent-up excitement for this project. On the other hand, I'm sure that presents some challenges. How do you keep the place from feeling just packed to the gills? So we've been using time ticketing to try to make sure that guests flow through on a um, kind of spread out throughout the day. And that has been a great way to make sure that it doesn't feel overcrowded or that you didn't get a chance to see something. Um, The unfortunate side to that is that if you don't get your time ticket in advance, I've had we've had to, you know, tell turn people away at the door. And there's nothing harder than telling a family that they can't visit that day. So kids are heartbroken. It's terrible. (laughs) So this time ticketing, this is something people should be doing ahead of time on the website. It's so easy. If you go on the website and buy your tickets, you get to choose the day and time that you'd like to visit, and then you're guaranteed that you can get in at that time. So it sounds like something to highly recommend for people wanting to check this out. So that's kind of the state of the people visitors. Let's talk a little bit about these animal residents. Now, Erin, as the curator of the aquarium, I'm wondering, what was it like to oversee the transition of thousands of fish and other creatures to this new home? Well, it's, it's one of those things you have to decide, uh, you know, what, what would guests like to see when they come in, what would be intriguing to introduce, you know, people of St. Louis uh, to something they've probably never seen before and, and you know, what, what actually gets along with each other and would do well in each of the habitats we designated for it. And I'm assuming that one of the things you knew you had to have for reasons of popularity are sharks. I mean, is the only question just how big a shark you can fit? Yeah, so our, our main exhibit is Shark Canyon, uh, obviously, so we do need uh, one or two sharks in there. So it, it, it did come down to you know, did we want some a few like really, really big sharks or, or did we want a lot of sharks? So we opted for actually kind of not having the really huge sharks uh, and going with a lot of the smaller sharks. So, you know, every twist and corner, you're, you're bound to see a shark. And so what's the biggest shark you've got in there? So our biggest shark right now is the brown shark. Uh, it gets to be about six, seven feet long. So it's That's still, a pretty, it's a pretty big good, shark. decent size. Yeah. I wouldn't want to see that when I'm out swimming. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, what does that look like for a, a six-foot brown shark? How do you get that to St. Louis? And how do you get him settled in without being a shock to his system that you're, you're putting him in this new home? It, it, it does involve a lot of processes for, for getting an animal like that. Uh, I always constitute like pouring money down the drain because literally we are transporting these animals in water. And once we get them here, we dump all that water down the drain. Uh, so we're, we're paying, <laughs> paying to move all that water just to pour it down the drain. Uh, but naturally, that's what that animal has to live in. So that's the way we have to do it. Uh, you know, and then we go through an acclimation process, ensure that the animal's uh, settling well, uh, and then we move it into its new habitat. So you're sort of easing them into this new home. Slowly but surely, yeah. And depending on, you know, we do checks of water parameters and all kinds of different uh, specs just to make sure that, you know, when we are moving those animals, that everything matches. I'm wondering for an animal that's six feet long, how do you even begin to get that through the doorway that, you know, it's got to be in water, I assume, while you're doing it? That's like the problem of a couch times a million. Tell me what that looks like. It's it's actually not as hard as you think it is. Uh, We use what we call a shark stretcher. Uh, so we'll take that shark, we'll put it in the stretcher, and, and we carry it right on to exhibit once okay, it's ready. Okay, what's a shark stretcher? Describe this for it, us. Ex- exactly what it sounds. It's a stretcher, yeah. Like, you know, you would carry a, a human on. It's just a stretcher. We put the shark in, uh, you know, make sure that it, it, it's 
well under control and, and move it right to its exhibit. So, Tammy, you're there, you know, on the job, and you're seeing people just walk by with a shark on a stretcher. Yeah, you know, one of those scenes that you get used to working in an aquarium, I guess. <laughs> That's, I mean, this is just amazing to me. I want to talk also about the piranhas. Um, I know we heard from um, a rep for the aquarium who was saying, oh, they're actually such lovely, kind animals. Do you have any animals where you have to worry about um, them biting you or them not wanting human interaction as you're transferring them to the new home? Uh, I mean, always, you know, when, when you work with animals, there's always the risk of animals or children, risk of things not going as planned. Uh, but no, it, you know, we have a well-trained staff, uh, you know, many, many years of experience uh, that we've, you know, made bad decisions at times, I guess, and, and, and you know, got the pointy end. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, I, overall, you know, it's a really good experienced staff and, and, you know, we got the animals transitioned in and without any issues. So no fingers were lost during nope, the opening no fingers of this were lost. aquarium. I still have all 10 digits. Uh, yeah. And I've been in the industry many years. So, so far, so good. So I find myself wondering, it, it seems like the movement with zoos today is they're trying to come up with habitats that will stimulate the animals a little bit, that they're not just stuck in a small cage where we can see them up close. Is that something that, that matters at all to marine life? Uh, it, it matters with every animal out there. So even even to the smallest of animal, you know, if we were at, to have fleas, it, it would matter. Uh, luckily, we don't have fleas. Uh, but yeah. Uh, you, we want to make sure that the habitat that these animals are living in, and you know, we'll be caring for them the rest of their natural lives. So we want to make sure that habitat uh, is something that they're comfortable in, something that you know, will will always be home to them. I've heard that the octopus tank is an example of this; that it looks pretty cool. Tell us a little bit about that. So the octopus tank uh, is is actually a really neat exhibit. It's actually almost two tanks hooked together by a, a tube. So the octopus has the the option of going between any tank that it wants to through this through the tube, uh, and then one of the things you know we have a very excellent training staff, uh, you know one of the best trainers I believe out there, uh, that actually is will is working with the octopus and we'll you know we'll begin to train it to do different things and shift just like any other animal would. So it's it's something different than most places would actually see with 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 fish or or invertebrates. Okay, so that's something that's just as important, if not even more so, for for these animals that you have. Yeah, because enrichment's very important. So uh, just like you know. Uh, we need our stimulus, you know, we need to go play sports, we need people to tell us we did a good job, you know, uh, we need to get our paychecks. Uh, the same thing with animals, we, we want to enrich them to, you know, keep their lives always changing. We're talking to Aaron Sprawl. He's the curator of the St. Louis Aquarium. And we're also here today with Tammy Brown, who's the executive director of the aquarium. I want to go to the phone lines. Uh, Jennifer is calling from Crave Core. Jennifer, hi, you're on St. Louis on the air. Hi, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Have you been to the St. Louis Aquarium yet? We just left there, and I was looking for anyone I could tell. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It was marvelous. That is so great to hear. Tell us, what about it um, did you like in particular? We went at 10 a.m. The crowds were slim at that moment. Um, It was an easy, nice flow. There was no rush. We could get to every exhibit. We could spend as long as we wanted at each exhibit. Um, even the train ride, <laughs> the pseudo train ride at the beginning was just magical. All of it, just um, delightful and colorful and very hands-on. Um, beautiful, wonderful experience. And I just wanted to say thank you for bringing this to St. Louis. I think it adds to our landscape, and I think it will be here for years and years to come. Jennifer, thank you so much for that call. Tammy, that's got to be great to hear. It's wonderful to hear, absolutely, and I love the word magical. That means that we have accomplished our goal of creating a memory, creating a connection for our guests, and that's what we're trying to do for every guest that walks through the door. Now, this is a city where a lot of the attractions are taxpayer-supported, and they end up being free because of that. Do you hear from some people who are like, hey, I'm used to just walking in and out of the zoo. Why do I have to pay $20? Five dollars to go to the aquarium. Right, right. We do. And our first answer is we have 13,000 mouths to feed three times a day. <laughs> That's a very good answer. <laughs> right, right. Um, so uh, if anyone does have a concern about price, um, I would mention that we do have our foundation. And the St. Louis Aquarium Foundation is um, dedicated to making sure that everyone has access. And I know they're starting with school groups so that Title I schools can get funding so that they can visit if they can't afford the field trip cost. 
um, but then they're also looking at helping other organizations like maybe Big Brothers and Big Sisters or something along those lines to help organizations to provide some uh, help on ticketing. Okay. That's Tammy Brown, the executive director of the St. Louis Aquarium. And we're also talking to Aaron Sprawl, the curator. We're going to take a quick break here in a second. Um, but if you do want to join our conversation, I want to invite you to do that. You can give us a call at 314-382-8255. That's 382-TALK. Or you can send us a tweet at STL on air. Or you can email us at talk at stlpublicradio.org. So let's go ahead and take that break now. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWS. Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com. Welcome back to St. Louis on the Air. We're talking to Tammy Brown, Executive Director of the St. Louis Aquarium, and Aaron Sprawl, who's Curator of the Aquarium. And Aaron, I'm I'm curious about your background. I know you've worked all over the world in aquariums, but you're actually a native of Kansas City. So as a Midwestern kid, what got you interested in the ocean and in aquatic life? Uh, Wow. Uh, You know, we, we would take our family vacations to the ocean probably once every three or four years. Uh, always fascinated by, you know, what what was going on beneath the water. Very rarely had a chance to even like snorkel, you know, and, and things like that. We'd play in the ocean. But it's one of those things that, you know, living in the Midwest, you, you just don't get that opportunity to see what's actually under under the water, especially when the ocean is, you know, thousands of miles away. So, yeah, I just grew up fascinated by it. Uh, when I graduated high school, I immediately moved to the coast, you know, became a beach bum for a while and decided, well, better go back to Better go to school and, and make something of my life. So yeah. Be- and did you go in go to school at that point, knowing I want to work with sea life? Uh, I actually went to school thinking, you know, I was going to be a doctor. Uh, <laughs> but then, uh, yeah, I, you know, it's still the beach was was fascinating to me. I love loved being on the beach. So, and yeah, marine biology was a lot easier than medical school. <laughs> so. Uh, but yeah, so that's how I got into marine biology. And today, as you're seeing these Midwestern kids with their noses up against the glass looking at these sea life, do you think back to your own childhood? I, I do. I love. Uh, so I had the opportunity to open up, uh, you know, the aquarium in my hometown in Kansas City. So uh, and then the, when the opportunity came to open up the aquarium in St. Louis, I, I jumped to the opportunity uh, just because being from the Midwest, it's. It, it is an amazing thing. It's not something, you know, I've opened aquariums all over the world, and people that live on the coast don't really have an appreciation for what's underneath the water. And Midwesterners, just they love aquariums. They love being able to touch, you know, a pencil urchin or a pincushion urchin or a sea cucumber or a stingray. And it's just, you know, it's it's something more, it, like the caller said, magical uh, that, you know, people that live on the coast take for granted. Now, Tammy Brown, uh, your background was actually in museums before you were hired by the Cleveland Aquarium. How does that background tie into what you're doing, what you were doing there and what you're doing here? Right. So my background really is about the operational side uh, primarily. And there are a lot of similarities between museums and aquariums um, just in terms of guest service and operations and all that sort of thing. What was new for me when I opened the aquarium in Cleveland was I was used to, you know, you hang something on, on a wall or you throw it in a cube and it stays there um, and you don't have to feed it. So <laughs> learning the whole living animal collection was a big learning curve for me. And thankfully, our team was very patient with my stupid fish questions when I started. And Erin, uh, tell us a little bit about that. I mean, what is this What is this like trying to get all these creatures fed? I think Tammy mentioned at some point just how many mouths there are, 13,000, something like that. Um, is there a large staff where their job is just to go around uh, dumping some fish food into the into the water? There is a large staff, and we are patient with their questions as well. No, <laughs> <laughs> no there, there, there is a large staff, and it, it is a specialty that, you know, each individual has on the, the staff that we hired. Uh, you know, some are really good with fresh water, some with salt, some with inverts. So, uh, you know, there's, there's, there is many different types of mouths to feed and we have to calculate, you know, based on body weight and things like that, how much food we need to feed out to, to ensure the proper animal welfare of this. Cause you know, one of the things we take for granted, you know, we just eat and some of us get quite large, some of us don't eat enough. So, you know, for proper animal health, we want to make sure that they maintain the, the proper body weight and We've got a number of callers who would like to join this conversation. Um, I'm going to go to Jim from Bridgeton. Jim, hi, you're on St. Louis on the air. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you. Um, I have a question for the young man you've just been speaking to. 
What does the curator of an aquarium do? I understand what a curator does for an art museum or something like that, but it seems an unusual title for someone involved with an aquarium. Jim, that's a great question, and I feel like you are um, filling in for the fact that I should have asked this question. So, Aaron Sprawl, what does that actually mean? Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for the young man comment. Uh, <laughs> But a curator is, is exactly, it, it really is exactly the same as a museum curator, you know. Uh, in, in essence, we have a, a living work of art. Each exhibit, each habitat is a living work of art. And we have to decide, you know, what, what's going to be showcased and, and what's going to work together. Um, Jim, does that answer your question? Or were you looking for maybe even more specifics about how he goes about uh, curating this collection of fish? Uh, uh, a follow-up, perhaps, is is his academic course of study was he a marine biologist or, or ecologist or or um, I heard the comment about wanting to be a doctor, but yeah. I'm just curious how he ended up in this in this kind of a role. No, so uh, yeah, I did graduate with a degree in marine biology from the University of Miami. Uh, I did a lot of field work, truthfully, uh, before I got into the aquarium industry, uh, and then. The aquarium industry is a lot easier. It's it's more settling. Uh, you're not traveling around the world as much. So, uh, but yeah, and then you you know you just kind of studying through the animals, learning the animals, learning their behaviors. You learn to you learn what works together and what doesn't work together, uh, and you know how to uh, mitigate potential issues. Um, Jim, thank great. you for those. Thank you for those thank great you. questions. Um, let's go to Carly, who's calling from St. Louis. Carly, hi. You're on St. Louis on the air. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my husband and I got a membership for Christmas, so we uh, took our eight-month-old son on New Year's Eve and had an absolute blast. Uh, so, first of all, thank you. This has been uh, this is an awesome experience. Um, I was really excited to see all of the interactive exhibits, and for an eight-month-old, it's hard to teach him how to, you know, gently pet a horseshoe crab or anything. So we had to wait on a few things. But it made me wonder um, about the aquarium growing. Are there only going to be permanent exhibits, or will there be things that are visiting or temporary uh, throughout its uh, time here in St. Louis? Carly, that's a great question. Tammy, do you have plans to do some rotating exhibits? We don't have um, necessarily the space to do rotating exhibits, but uh, Aaron and his team will constantly be looking at uh, the exhibits and how they're growing out and how the animals in them are faring and whether we should be thinking about adding uh, new species. And so everything will change in that way. But also the other wonderful thing that happens is that the fish grow. So like the the uh, Goliath grouper, for example, right now is, I think, about 70 pounds the last I heard. And they can grow to be hundreds of pounds. So the animals will change just themselves as they grow and as they get used to their habitat and take on new behaviors. So there's always something different. Uh, Carly, thank you for that question. We did hear from um, another listener, Sharon, uh, through our Facebook page, and she she left us a pretty detailed review of the aquarium. And overall, you know, there was a lot she liked. She did feel that sort of by the end um, that there were some places that maybe looked a little bit of unfinished um, and that she's hoping to see some changes with she thought some computer screens were too small and she would wanted a little more information on some of the displays. Is the aquarium at this point still a work in process or do you feel like it's pretty much, uh, you know, the substantial work is done? Well, I think the, a lot of the work is done, but we will never be completely done. And I'd say that because we really take our guest uh, feedback very seriously, as well as our team feedback. We've already got a laundry list of probably, you know, two pages single spaced of things that we would take a look, like to take a look at based on the first couple of weeks of being open. So that will continue to evolve and grow and uh, we'll add new programs and new activities based on our own interests as well as the um, our own interests, meaning like a scuba show or something like that, um, as well as guest feedback and lots to come. And, and on top of that, we do have a lot more animals coming in. Uh, so several more species of shark that we're going to be adding to Shark Canyon. Uh, you know, we are in talks with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services about bringing in sea turtles. Uh, so there's there's still a lot more to, that's going to be coming in uh, in, in a lot of the habitats for guests to see. So they'll, they'll always be changing. Okay. And some more animals on the way. We did have a, a listener who'd been wondering about the sea turtles. So that's great to give that person an affirmative uh, answer there. Let's go to Michael calling from Rolla. Michael, hi, you're on St. Louis on the air. Hey guys, thanks for taking my call. Yes, um, thank you. I wanted to know, uh, how are you guys getting your animals? Like, are they rescue animals? Because I always wonder, you know, when I go to places like that, like, is my money funding, you know, shady breeding practices or 
or are the animals being taken care of to try to maybe be released again? You know what I mean? Yeah. Are, are rescue animals a thing with fish? I guess I've never thought about that question. So, uh, Michael, that's that's a great question to raise. Aaron, um, where are you getting these animals? So our animals do come from a number of sources. Uh, we try to work with other institutions to rehome uh, what's deemed surplus animals. So animals that, you know, they don't really have room for that now we're an open institution we can accept. Uh, we have accepted a lot of, uh, rehomed a lot of animals from uh, pet owners uh, who, you know, buy a catfish thinking, you know, like a red tail catfish, for example, thinking, you know, it's just this little fish and, and not realizing that it's going to get four or five feet long. Uh, so we, we have rescued animals like that, uh, you know, rehabilitated animals or rescue rehabilitated animals that, you know, from Fish and Wildlife Service and other organizations. Uh, so, yeah, there's 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 numerous sources. Uh, all our animals, as far as the, the shady question, that's a good question. Uh, we do accredit uh, all our vendors uh, who we would be acquiring animals from. Uh, so they have to go through this process on letting us know where they acquired their animals from just to ensure that everything is basically a sustainable process. Um, Michael, thank you for that question. That's a great one. Um, Steve, I want to go to the phone lines. Uh, Steve calling from Shrewsbury. Um, Steve, hi, you're on St. Louis on the air. Thanks. Just curious, uh, being a guy and gory and all that, what do you feed your piranha and your sharks? And do you typically do that uh, during open hours or is that something that's done after hours? But Steve is asking this question on behalf of every 12-year-old boy out there. So thank you, Steve, for that. Aaron, how does that work? Uh, so all, all our fish uh, do actually restaurant quality seafood. Uh, so they do eat fish. I know it's an abomination for any uh, Lilo and Stitch fans. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, we do feed them restaurant quality seafood. Uh, and basically I, what I tell people what that means is basically every fish in that aquarium eats better than I do. <laughs> and do you feed them in front of people if someone's bloodthirsty and wants to watch the shark tearing a smaller fish from, from bone to bone? Is that something they can get in on? We, we do actually feed uh, all the fish in front of the public. Uh, so we try to feed uh, when the guests are there. Uh, it's not as exciting and, and blood curling as I guess everybody thinks it would be. Uh, so, for instance, you know, all, all our sharks are, are target trained. Uh, they know when it's the time to eat. Uh, they know their station where they're supposed to go to. They have a specific location in the tank. So they'll come over and, and we'll feed them that way. And, uh, yeah, and then they go on about their daily activities. So it's, it's all just training and enrichment. So when you say they're target trained, is that, you might be answering this question we've all wondered about, is that why the sharks don't eat the other fish that are there within their tank? That That's one of the reasons, yeah. So they know specifically when it's their time to eat. Uh, they come over and, and eat at that time, but also we feed them every other day, uh, where typically in the wild, a shark would only eat about once every two weeks. So you keep uh, them pretty full. So we keep them nice and satiated, yeah. So they're always, they're never hungry. Going back to the piranhas, um, is this something where Steve or bloodthirsty people could see a, a piranha attack? Don't they swarm, or is that a, a myth from horror movies? It, it is a myth, uh, thanks to Teddy Roosevelt, I think, who created that myth of, of these, you know, man-eating piranha. Uh, believe it or not, we actually dive the piranha tank. We put divers in it to clean it regularly. So, you know, they're in the tank with 450 piranha right now. Uh, so, yeah, and, and never any trouble. And even when we drop the food in there, uh, the piranhas scatter and they're scared and they never want to come to the eat. And then, you know, it, after about a minute or so, one kind of gets the courage up to start eating. And then and then they will start eating. But, yeah, it, it takes a while. So the piranhas are scared. Well, fans of gore may be slightly disappointed by that answer. But uh, thank you for filling us in on all that. And thanks for your call, Steve. Uh, we're going to take one more call here. This is Mary calling from University City. Mary, hi. You're on St. Louis on the Air. For taking my call. Um, yeah, I had a question about the pricing, the admission, getting in the aquarium. Um, are you considering doing any senior pricing um, for older folks that want to go see the aquarium? We do have a discount for seniors, 65 plus. It's 20% off, as well as a discount for military, veteran, and first responders. That's also 20% off. The challenge, I'll be right up front, is that um, we require to be able to see an ID to offer those discounts, and given our status of sold out um, <laughs> up until now, um, that has been difficult. So we are working with our ticketing company to try to figure out a way that you can get that discount with an online purchase. So stay tuned for that. Okay. Oh, okay. Great. Great. And one other question: Do you 
um, have any kind of breeding program, or do you primarily get your fish from other sources? But do you breed any of the fish there at the aquarium and put them in tanks when they're big enough? Mary, thank you for that call. I know Aaron did talk a bit about where the fish came from, but are there plans to breed any while they're there? Yeah, so fish do breed, and yeah, we do. We are setting up uh, different programs that we're looking to be uh, participants of as far as breeding, uh, including like the Reef Track, who's actually targeting to save the Caribbean reefs right now that are in major trouble. Okay. Well, thank you for that call, Mary. We did have another question that came in. I, I don't know if it was from email or Twitter, but um, Matt writes, as much as I love kids, I'm a young adult who doesn't have one. The biggest gripe with my recent aquarium visit out of town was that I couldn't experience the aquatic life or learn more about them because it was mostly a kids or family-based attraction. I know it can be overwhelming to people who don't have kids. Are there plans to have times that are 18 plus or more adult friendly times the way the City Museum does that? So we don't have specific times for 18 plus, but I would tell you that Friday and Saturday evening, that's mostly what we saw for our crowds. So if it's possible to visit Friday, Saturday night, that's the best time. Okay. Well, that's some great advice. And um, I got to thank our two guests. You, you guys both have answered so many questions from our listeners, and I know there's even more out there, but it's just great to see so much excitement about this project that you're in. So uh, Tammy Brown, Executive Director of the St. Louis Aquarium, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. And Curator Aaron Sproul, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. For having me. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com.